Okay, so we have a bunch of points here. The blue ones are places where you can see f prime is equal to zero, and the red ones uh, are points of inflection. Alrighty. So as I told you, when we started this chapter, a, a, a big part of this is graphing functions by hand, not needing to have a calculator graph it for us. Uh, it's kind of motivation here. So could someone use this information, knowing what points of inflection are, know what f prime equals zero means, just come up here and sketch through these points of Reasonable, reasonable looking graph. Uh, yeah, like a I can try. I know. Kind of sounds good. Yeah. How about kind of sounds good. Just for six straight years. I heard kind of sounds good. I feel like you're setting the bar faster than I can get. Just for this. Yeah, then why don't you give it a shot? All right. What do you think about that? Bit better. Bit better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bit better. You can do better? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's as best it gets. Oh, yeah. As bad as good as it gets, I would say. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what did you correct about Gavin's work? Um, going through points of inflection and making sure that we're in zero slope, which we're in zero slope. So points of inflection are points on the graph, so the graph has to go through those points. Oh. Those are the exact points where what happens? Cavity switches. Uh, and then we made sure I have a zero slope there and there. Uh, down through here, we tried to change my cavity. Looks good. And the cavity changes. My cavity changes. Got the zero slope here again. And down here, it looks like it concave down. Maybe we could have pulled that concave down a little bit longer. It looks like maybe the point of inflection is here or somewhere. That's all right. And then we get a zero slope. Okay. So that. It kind of takes quite a bit of calculus to get that information. Like, not a lot of work for a problem like this, but uh, a lot of stuff we've learned so far to get to this point, right? Yeah. So, what I noticed though, this is what, this will be what we do today, that your graphs kind of end, both Kendra and Gavin's just kind of stop. Oh, are those are those all the that prime equal zero? Yeah. So, so this one should go down. Yeah. Should it? Yes. Maybe it should. Uh, if it can't go back up. If it can't go if, if it were to go up then it would be another zero slope. Okay, so it doesn't go back up. 
but uh, you know, maybe something else could happen. But but it doesn't go back up, that's for sure. Uh, and this one here probably also goes up, but we just can't say for sure. Okay. So what we're talking about here is not the middle behavior, but end behavior. End behavior. Okay. So we're going to talk about end behavior, but in calculus we call it a little bit different because we do think about it a little bit differently. We do approach it uh, slightly differently than in, in the past. Um, it's a limit at infinity. Right? We've taken limits at specific values, the limit at 2, the limit at negative 5, or whatever. But now we're going to look at the limit of a function as x approaches infinity, or as x approaches, what do you think? Negative. Negative infinity. Okay. Um, so that is on the, the schedule for today. But before we even move on to that, I'm just giving you a little heads up. Before we move on to that, I want you to do something similar to this. I want you to find zero slopes, points of inflection, and use them, <coughs> pardon me, to help you draw at least the middle part of this graph that we're about to look at. Okay? So let's do that. I'll give you the, the function that I want you to do this with. It's that one. Okay. I just want you to, to, to use what we've, we've learned so far to find all of the uh, maxima and minima and the other zero slopes you might have that aren't max, maxima or minima, uh, points of inflection. Graph those points, right, the x and y values, not just where they are uh, with respect to x, but also what the y value of them uh, is. And there's now. Okay. And. Um, Graph those points and then use those points just as we did, uh, as, as Gavin and Kendra did, to graph at least the middle part. And then we'll talk about the end behaviors. Give you a couple minutes to work on that. All right. So we're going to find the uh, maximum minute and the points of inflection. Um, and you know, we've got a job to do here. The first thing you would do, like you're going to hang a picture. Right? Yeah, you get your tools out. So let's take the derivative and the second derivative. Let's get that hammer and nail ready. So y prime equals 12x to the third plus 12x squared. Double prime equals 6x squared plus 24x. <coughs> Zeros of it, so that we'll know where the slope is zero, so we'll know where we might have some extrema. Okay, so let's over here. We'll do 12x cubed plus 12x squared equals zero. Back out of 12x squared, x plus one equals zero. So either x equals zero or x equals negative one. This guy will set it equal to zero. Why are we setting this equal to zero? Points of inflection. Points of inflection, if there are any, or at least candidates for points of inflection. information is going to be useful. If we're looking for extrema, we've got to find points where the slope is zero. If we're going to find points of inflection, we've got to find places where the second derivative is zero. Okay. So if the second derivative is zero, that means that the first derivative, uh, well, that's the only place the first derivative might possibly be changing from, um, from increasing to decreasing. Okay. It's that place where the, or from decreasing to increasing. It's where it's at, at its steepest. 
Um, so now that we have this information, we have the places that we want. These are really the only places we're interested in at this moment. Uh, now we can make that little table that helps us keep that information straight. So, so every x value and every interval between those x values and, and then the n on the left and right. So, um, so negative infinity to negative one. Yeah, but they are points that we are interested in. Oh. Okay, we should include them. And x is equal to negative two thirds. Because at this point, we want to we want to make a determination, make a conclusion: is this a point of inflection or not? Right? At the very end, this the last column here is going to be our conclusions about: oh, we got a maximum, or we've got uh, increasing, or we've got a point of inflection, whatever. And then from negative two thirds to zero, and from zero to you have to write down just, just x there. equals zero, and then zero. That then the interval from zero to infinity. <coughs> Or sorry, f of x, f prime of x, and now f double prime of x. And then we'll have conclusions about all this stuff. For the f of x, it's just the value of f of x that we care about, the y value. There's lots of y values on the intervals, so on intervals, we're not going to look into the actual value of f of x. Okay. But on an interval, f prime will have not one value, but it'll have a consistent positive or negative value uh, if, if at that place we have a slope of zero. So at this place we have a slope of zero. At uh, zero we have a slope of zero. Uh, at f double prime at zero we have a zero for f double prime. And at negative two thirds we have a zero for f double prime. So let's look at f prime. It must be that it's uh, increasing or decreasing. We get a zero. Then increasing or decreasing here, right? It, it can only stop increasing or decreasing, um, or be it having a positive or a negative slope uh, when it comes to a zero slope, and then afterwards. So positive or negative slope, positive or negative slope, positive or negative slope. Okay. <coughs> and um, we must have concave up or down, concave up or down. So we should find the, the y values at these points. So f of negative 1 is negative 1. Is negative yeah. 1, yeah. f of negative 2 thirds? 16, 20 seconds. 16, 20 seconds. OK, and 0. So at these points, negative 1 comma negative 1, negative 2 thirds comma 16 over 27, 0, 0, um, stuff may be happening. We may have some extrema or some points of inflection. So um, let's see. What we want to find here is if this is a, a maximum or a minimum. What's that? We want to know if that, so this is, is a, a 0 for f prime. We want to find out if it's a maximum or a minimum. For the negative energy, negative one, we want to figure out if that's a positive or a negative. We could do that, but what is easier if it oh, works? Second out? derivative test. Second derivative test. See if it's concave down or concave okay. up, because either way. Okay, so how do we figure out if it's concave down or concave up? Positive or negative. Uh, yeah, positive or negative. So we'll take negative one, the x value, plug it into the second derivative, and it'll tell us if it's concave up or down, or oh, the test will fail. Positive. Okay, so it's concave up. So we got a zero slope. It's concave up. We have a minimum. A minimum. Okay, now I'm dead. Is the problem? Yeah. That's 
minimum, the next one is zero slope to zero. So between those two zero slopes, there's x. That's a positive number. And it becomes less. Well, let's just fill in all this information. If it does cause it so that like, you can't graph it for some reason, then maybe we made a mistake and we should go back. The only mistake that I possibly see here, I would say maybe the 16 over 27. We got a few people who got that. Was he right? Yeah, that's what I think. Okay. That was Kendra, so that's yeah. right. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can Stuart. Yeah, she's a math tutor, guys. Everybody says that. Yeah. Oh, like, so it's perfect. Kendra, it must be right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, must be a hard face on for me. And you so I had, at zero, zero, we got a zero slope, but then this happens to be a zero for the second derivative. So what do we say about the second derivative test? Fail. Oh. It fails. So what do we fall back to? The first derivative first test. We look on the left. We look on the right. Let's see what we've got. So let's look on the left. Uh, anywhere really between negative 1 and 0 will work. So let's see what the slope is doing at x is negative 1 half. Um, here we have, we, we are looking for maxima. Here's one. We have a minimum. And then we try to use the second derivative test on, on this point, but it fails because the slope is, or the, the second derivative is 0. So we have to go back to the first derivative test. So we've got to find a, a, a test point between this slope of zero and this slope of zero. Okay. And that's between negative one and zero. So something between negative one and zero. Uh, okay, that makes more sense. Right? It's a negative. Negative 16. Okay. This is? Yeah. That makes more sense. Because yeah. if so, you go from, you go from a negative to a positive. Oh, yeah. So it should be negative 16 over 27? Right. Yeah. Because if we have a minimum, then there's no maximum. That's that. That's that. That's that. If that was a positive, there wouldn't have been a maximum. Uh, okay, we come back to zero. That's interesting. I'm glad you did. couldn't let it go. So what did we find out? What did somebody pick a test point to the left of zero? To figure out what the slope is doing. Actually, negative point one. Negative point one, and you found what kind of a slope? Positive. You got a positive slope. Yes. Okay. Hopefully, more than just Aaron did this, but. Any point we pick between negative 1 and 0 should have the same kind of slope, either negative or positive. So it doesn't really matter which one we pick. We can say now, if Aaron found the correct value and it is a positive slope, then all of these are positive here, right? Which means that every place here is increasing, OK? I guess we shouldn't say it for that point. It can't be increasing on that point. It's increasing on those intervals. So it's increasing here, so we look to the right to see if it's it's also increasing. Yes. So it's got a positive slope here, it's also increasing here. So we don't have an extrema, right? But we might have so it's not it's not a max or a min, but it might be a point of inflection if what happens? So it changes from constant to constant. Or vice versa. Okay, so we look to the left. Anything between negative two thirds and zero? Negative one third, or what? Okay, we gotta pick that. What are we gonna do if we say take negative one third? What are we gonna do with that? F double prime to see if it's positive or negative. Determine if it's calculate up or down. Which 
positive on the right. Negative two thirds, or negative one third, sorry, or negative one third, since it's between negative two thirds and zero. Plug it in the second derivative to see if we get positive or negative. Okay, we're talking about the constant. Mm. You get positive? Yeah, 16. Positive. So we could also say it's concave up. Okay. And how about to the right? Anything from zero to infinity? So we can have some light. One, a lot of positive. positive. Okay, so. It's all fun from the concave up. So whole pair up. Function itself is increasing, which means that it's got a positive slope. You can have a positive slope and still be, you can have a positive slope either they're concave up, concave up or concave down. So we'll, we'll show. Most, most points of inflection are that way. Either it's on a, a place where the function is increasing the whole way here. Let me give you an example. Here's an increasing function that switches from concave up to concave down. Right, there's the point of inflection. We got increasing positive slopes and still increasing positive slopes afterwards. Okay. okay. I don't think you could have drawn that any more perfectly. That's, That's true. true. No. Right, yes. uh, okay, so let's uh, let's put this minimum down. There's a minimum at negative one, negative one. One, negative one. Right, we could that little note there that's a little. Um, 
And let's see, you're gonna point it from flexion at negative two thirds, negative 16 over 27. Okay, negative two thirds, negative 16 over 27. That's a little less than 20. Half. Less than two thirds of one there. Okay, so we're right there, that. Coming down here, it's, it's coming kind of down, we got the point of inflection. We got, we got a zero slope and a point of inflection at zero, zero. Okay, here, f prime of zero is zero, so it's, it's horizontal. And uh, we have a point of inflection as well. Um, so it's it's concave down here. <coughs> it's concave down. And then, or sorry, concave up. I said concave down a bunch of times. It's concave up, then it switches to concave down, and then it flattens out. But it's also a point of inflection, it switches to concave up. And then this is concave up, like that. Right? Does seem believable? So here's the point of inflection. Well, here's the point of inflection. I'll make it bigger. It's concave kind of down right there. Just for a second. So that one zero, it just like bubbles out and then switches? Mm -hmm. So it does have a zero slope and it switches concavity at that point. All right? And it's concave up from here on out, it seems. It would just keep going up like that. What do you think? Does Would you believe that it goes up like that from what you know about polynomial functions already? Yes, sir. Because? The exponent is, uh, is, is 4. That's an even one. right? So this number will always be a positive number. No matter what you plug in for x, you'll get a positive number. Then you multiply that positive number by positive 3. And so on the ends, the end of the you should recall that a little bit. Uh, it goes off to infinity. Okay. Now, we just practice finding all the, the extrema, the points of inflection. And I know that looks like a lot of work. Okay. But if we are really understanding what we're looking at and what concavity is and, and what increasing means and what, you know, what we're really looking for, then, it, well, this is, in my opinion, certainly the easiest way to keep track of all that stuff. So you could just kind of write it all over the paper, but I've seen it. It's hard. People most of the time get that wrong, and it's hard to follow. It's hard to grade. useful little tool there. So what we need to figure out, what about a function that's different than this? We know about polynomial functions, and we know that uh, an even degree and a positive leading coefficient means that the ends will go up, okay? which means that the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x to the fourth plus 4x to the third is infinity. And the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 3x to the fourth plus 4x to the third is infinity. infinity. Also infinity. <coughs> but we want to be challenged beyond that. Um, about this one. the middle stuff a little bit later, and also let's talk about the, the ends, okay? And, and what I, I'm hoping you see is the motivation for the end behavior, or the limits at infinity, are that unless you know what it's going to do beyond that last piece of information, that last extrema, or that last um, point of inflection, we don't know what to make the graph look like. We have done this before. We have talked about this before. Very in our algebra 2 and pre-calculus classes, the limit as x approaches infinity equals infinity to 3. Oh, oh, I oh, that. Remember this. Oh. Why is it 3? Because yeah, like squared over x squared. That's 1. We have 3. The bank next to me, I got put. <laughs> 
You got some money, yo. <laughs> okay, uh, 3x squared over x squared plus 1. Can you, again, can you go through why it is 3? Why is that? Well, the one on the denominator is regard, like, just disregard because x squared is so much more significant. Uh, the number 1 is kind of, when, yeah, when x is so big, then 1 is in so insignificant. Yeah. Right? And then x squared over x squared is 1, obviously. And then x squared over x squared is 3. Okay. Do you guys remember the discussion? Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then we have yeah. I have one like that for algebra two actually right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We got the x. So it, all this was about was that this was the uh, the most powerful term because it had the highest power, right? The highest exponent. So I'm pretty happy about this one. And then I can change a, b, and c. They are. Yeah, pretty awesome. Anyway. have to know it made an impact and just go remember it. Yes. Okay, so yeah, that's going to go to three. So sometimes uh, our, our, our functions will just approach a single value. When will that happen? That's what it's called. It's called a horizontal asymptote. When will it approach this single value, though? As it approaches infinity. As it approaches infinity. Um, yes. What kinds of functions, I guess, will not go off to infinity. Tree. What's that? Tree functions. This isn't a tree function. Well, it's like all the kinds of moments. Now, what kinds of functions will just approach a single value? And like, when does that happen? How do we know that this approach like approaches a single x value or y value, or does it matter? It matters. It's approaching a y value of three. The x value is approaching infinity. The y value, as a result. Um, that's yeah, definitely the only example that I can think of is a function that has a denominator. Sine and cosine of those are those are always Okay. Why does this one approach three? Because the X squared is the same power in the numerator and denominator to the same degree if we want to get specific, right? The same degree. Okay. So a function like this, a rational function, one polynomial divided by another polynomial, will approach a single value <coughs> when you yeah, have less. Like you have the same degree in both of them. So anytime we have the same degree, we'll approach a single value. Right? So uh, we're in uh, 3.5. And so if you will turn to 3.5, and let's just maybe do some quick Mental calculations here. Okay, so let me just pick some out here. Seven. No, not seven. How about eight? Okay, eight. What is the limit as x approaches to infinity? Two. Two. Uh, what about the limit uh, for 8 as x approaches negative infinity? Negative. Two. 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 two or negative? Still, still two. 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 Why is it still 2 and not negative 2? It's an even degree. So an even degree will, it will always, out. even if you put a big negative number in there, it'll square it and it'll come out positive. <coughs> There's nothing to turn it negative. Okay? So let's just pause here for a second and talk about this number 8. Um, So can we change this 
so that, well, right now the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is 2. Could we somehow make it so that the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is negative 2? And that was because it has or even degrees, oh. so it will always just be a negative times infinity. Can you say that again? It has an even degree, so it will always end up being a negative times a negative. Right. So the negatives will cancel out. Yeah. 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 Well, yes. So what I'm asking is there something that we can change about this function so that we can make it cube. Yeah. <coughs> okay, let's investigate that. So for a no, negative over a negative. negative, and then regardless, it will cancel out, mm -hmm. and then we will get two. So at least. That it yeah, seems like you could change the two to a negative two. three. Okay, now if we change the two to a negative two, then it'll make the limit as x approaches infinity negative two. Okay. It'll make them both negative two. So, They're always both negative. Always. not always, but a lot of times, yeah. There's a, there's a some instances where you'll have two different horizontal asymptotes, but if you're talking about rational, asymptotes, rational functions, uh, we're fine. It's going to approach whatever this number over whatever this number is. What's the case if the denominator has a leading coefficient of like three? Then well, let's look. Something like, right. yeah. like times really big number minus one. Yeah, not going to matter. Minus one. Really Plus two, positive. right? We're, we're just reestablishing that it's just the highest power that matters in yeah. polynomial. Okay. So if we if we essentially ignore these for a second because we're letting x be so big, well now we've got two times eighty billion over three times eighty billion. Well, that's a ratio of two to three. Yeah. Right? Or nearly there. It is a little bit off because it's minus one and plus two, but it is so close that we could say, you know, it's always going to get closer and closer and closer to two thirds. Okay. If we put, uh, well, yeah, let's talk about this. This x approaches negative infinity of that. So it's still be two thirds because it's going to be a negative on the numerator and negative on the denominator. Right. Yeah. So this would be negative. This would be negative. The negative divided by negative is positive. So still two thirds. But okay. so just a. Uh, you know, transfer into how we would use this information in, in drawing a graph. Well, it's going to approach the value of two thirds. That's about right there. Okay, not in the middle, but somewhere at some point towards the right end, and somewhere at some point to the left end, it'll approach that value of two thirds. In the middle, that's where we use all of our maxima, minima, points of inflection. We might cross over the horizontal asymptote. Oh, right. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay if we cross over the horizontal asymptote. Um, but it is. Hmm? It is? It is what? Okay. Like if we're in the middle. Okay? Because uh, we're talking about the limits where? At the end point. At infinity, right? Okay. This is not infinity. Infinity is way out here or way out there. Okay, so you know we, we could kind of not draw this in the middle if we're uncomfortable about crossing the horizontal asymptote because the horizontal asymptote is only about the end. The eventuality is it will approach two thirds. Okay, now let's talk about 
uh, a different scenario. So if the, if the degrees are equally matched, then we're just going to approach the ratio of the leading coefficients. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ratio of the leading coefficients. What about something like? I was talking about 18 part A. 18 part A. 18 part A. Uh oh. I don't know if there's part C. I don't know if Use your, your same reasoning abilities to think about the degrees of the polynomials and what it means for this fraction will eventually approach as x becomes very large. It's a very small number. How do you come across that? Uh, we get this numerator, which will be big, because it'll be two times, you know, negative two times, hundred thousand million billion, whatever. Okay, but. This will be three times that same number times itself three times, yeah. which is just way bigger than just two times that number once. So essentially, we get that close and close to zero. Mm -hmm. It'll be smaller and smaller. It'll just be getting closer and closer to zero. Never get there. It's thrown off just the slightest bit uh, by well, the fact that you can't just do division and come up with zero. That's one thing. Um, and we're, we get this minus one. And but it'll get really, really close to zero. So that'll happen when? So now let's look at another function, another different variety of functions. Square 
ideally, no, because the square root of 4x squared plus 5 is not equal to the square root of 4x squared plus the square root of 5. True, okay. okay. Now, if, if we did have the square root around just that, then yeah, it would cancel out, and that would be 2x. Right? Okay. But it's not. It's around the whole thing. Solve it. Remind you what it is. You have to change it. You change it somehow so that we're not comparing Rational. square roots with. Well, I guess you still have those things. Oh, I have to square root of square root. Also, I have to square root of square root. Yeah. Uh, what square root would you use? One of the square root of 4x squared plus 5 or square root of 4x. Let's see what that would do. Idea before you even try it. I'm not guaranteeing it's going to work. You get a wand! Right, so oh, yeah. oh, like oh, 6x times the square root of 4x squared plus 5 over. Now, what is this going to be? Conjugate of what? The bottom of just the 4x squared well, plus 5. The only thing that's convenient about multiplying this by a square root is that it cancels out. But if we're because they're identical, if they were different in some way, there wouldn't be a canceling. Mm -hmm. But now we have to we have negative six x plus four x squared. But is it to the degree at this point? Is that just is it even the degree at this point? It's what even the degree? Well, the leading coefficient. Yeah. Negative six, because the square root. Well, it, we have, it would be if it was just negative 6 over 4x squared plus 5, but it's, it's negative 6x times this stuff, right? So that's going to affect how big that thing is. It's still, like, what's the interaction between things in the square root and out of the square root? That's what we want to know. Well, let's take, let's take, let's see, the leading coefficient and the square root. Okay, so that's one way to look at it, where when x becomes uh, infinitely large, adding 5 to 4x squared isn't going to do much to it, right? So this becoming more and more insignificant, this approach, this value will approach uh, whatever 4x squared is. I'm not going to say that in the beginning. That's going to be 2. It's going to be close to, it's going to be approaching the value of 2x. Oh, two asymptotes? Okay. No. Wait, plus or minus? Two horizontal asymptotes? Or minus. Oh, no, when we just, when the square root's in a function, we just take it to be the positive. Okay. The plus and minus comes when we want to, like, solve an equation like this. Okay. Now we're trying to find a, a number that will solve this equation, but two numbers will solve this equation. Okay. But when it's in a function, we just, when we take the square root in a function, we take it to just be the positive square root. So when it comes to, to taking things to infinity, we kind of can uh, let all these things go away, right? let them become insignificant, and take the square root of whatever that is. Okay. It's legitimate, but we would like to, maybe at least for a minute, look at it more mathematically than that. Maybe computationally. We could look at um, we could look at six uh, x as the square root of thirty six x squared. We write it that way. Right. 
which yeah. this could just be rewritten as the square root. This whole square root is such a big thing. Uh, 36x squared over 4x squared plus 5. Okay. So now we can see inside the square root, the limit inside the square root would be approaching what? So it's approaching 36 over 4, like the limit as x approaches infinity would be approaching, well, the negative square root of 1 over 36 over 4 is? It's 9. So that's 9. That's negative square root of 9. Negative 3. Mm -hmm. Wow, what? Isn't that really the same old without the modification? What's that? Like 6 over 2 would be. Negative 6 over 2 would be. This is just more direct rather than kind of saying like, well, it's kind of like this, and kind of take the square root of this. It's not really that good. Kind of. Too many kindness. Yeah, let's just use the one kind of right here. So will we always be able to do that, or will we, there be problems that you can't? Oh, so, I mean, the trig functions would yeah. create a different kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the ideas that were thrown out there, like multiply the numerator and denominator by square so root, multiply by the conjugate. What do they want without the graph? Uh, so, what we're saying is that as x approaches infinity, the function will approach negative 3. Okay, so as we move out this direction, the y value will get closer and closer to negative 3. As we move out this direction, the y value will get closer and closer to negative 3. <coughs> Once we get done with all of our points of inflection in the extreme line here, and once we're out of that information, we just kind of make the graph get close to that horizontal line. So uh, we make it a, a two different kind of horizontal numbers. And most infinity would be one point. And most negative would be one point. Well, that's actually, I'm rethinking this now. Because think about, if we put infinity in here, positive infinity, then this will certainly be true. But if we put in negative infinity, then if we, if we look at it this way, then we're going to square that negative number, and it'll become a, it'll come out positive. But the actual function is this. So we put a negative number in there, we'll get negative times negative, and that'll actually come out to be positive. Yeah. No, it's, still, it's still positive there. To infinity, it'll be negative. Whoa, that is a trick. To negative, negative infinity, it'll be positive. Right. So you have two different. So we'll have two different ones. Integrate with double teacher. Have you gone and seen under thing yet? Uh, here's what we can do. Multiply this by 1 over x, and we'll multiply this by 1 over x. Okay. So this will become the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 6x over x over the square root of 4x squared plus 5 over x. Okay. So in the numerator, we'll get... To get rid of any, any x's in the numerator, let all the x stuff be here. Did you not there? We get negative six. Uh, so you get negative six over, and now, um, let's see.
square root of 4x squared over x squared plus 5 over x squared. This would be the limit negative 6. Now this would be 4 plus 5 over x squared. As it approaches infinity, it doesn't ask about negative infinity. I think it might be part B. Does it ask about negative infinity? Doesn't? It's supposed to be like draw this table and then estimate the No, no, that's still the same problem. Huh? Six times it always be positive, so it'll always be negative. Damn. It'll always be negative, it'll always be negative three. No, we graph it as wrong. Well, it's negative three. Negative three. So you, I mean, okay, so one way to look at the graph. So the, the thing that the problem here is when we write this x, which this can be positive or negative, this value can take on a positive or a negative value. When we write it as the square root of x squared, that will always be a positive value. Right? Well, no, it's looking at the very bottom. So, what we need to do is if we, we'll, we'll take the infinities uh, to different infinities. We'll go to positive infinity. This way will be negative 3 over 2. Because this is be negative, negative 6 over, well, as x approaches infinity, this becomes so small that it like, won't be anything. So it will be negative 6 over the square root of 4, so you get negative 3 over 2. Okay. If we go back here, though, if we want to go to negative infinity, uh, we would just need to take the negative of this, which will give us the positive. We've done all the work correctly if we want to approach positive infinity. Okay? Now it doesn't ask this question, but it's worth asking. What's the limit as x approaches negative infinity? Uh, one way to do it is go back to our original function and say this is just pretty much the square root of 4x squared because as x becomes very large, this becomes more and more insignificant. And so as we approach negative infinity, we look at it that way, well, negative times negative will be positive. This will be positive up here. This will also be positive down here. It would be the positive uh, 2x-ish. Right? So uh, we'll be approaching positive 3 halves, or 6 halves, which would be positive. Okay. See that the problem uh, with doing it this way and just saying that the, both of the limits are the same is that when we Divide this by x, which is fine. We can multiply both by 1 over x and 1 over x. But when we try and bring these together by making this the square root of x squared, the square root of x squared is x, right? Unless x is negative. Okay. So if we let it approach negative infinity, if we go to this step, negative 6 over square root of 4x squared plus 5, uh, over square root of x squared. Well, we can see we haven't done any trickery other than multiplying by 1 over x in the numerator and denominator here. Um, whatever these are, they'll cancel each other out and they'll, they'll just negate each other completely. But in order to combine these together inside a square root, we wrote it as the square root of x squared, which is always positive. But if we put in negative infinity, if we let this x value be negative, this will be negative. So we just want to throw a negative like that. We make sure that that quantity comes out to be negative. Okay. So if we continue on from there, it's negative six over the negative square root of four x squared over x squared, which already plus five over x squared, which already ensures that it's going to be positive because we know it's negative in front of x. Like. Yeah, we make sure that, that that will come out negative because when we put negative values into that x, it should come out negative. So we make sure that it is negative. That's the only way to approach the negative infinity. And then we get negative 6 over negative 6 over negative square root of uh, 4. Okay, once we let x go to infinity and this becomes 0. 
and this becomes just four. So we have six over two. We're going to look at the graph through the horizontal asymptotes on the graph. As x approaches positive infinity, we approach negative 3 halves. So as we go out this way, there's negative 2 halves, negative 3 halves. There's our horizontal asymptote as we go to positive infinity. And then as we go to negative infinity, I'm still confused as to why it's negative 3 halves and not negative 3 on the bottom right. Oh, because I wrote it down wrong. And so, yeah, that's why. Shouldn't it be negative 3 halves for or 3 halves for anything. I don't know why I wrote down 3 halves. Negative 3 and positive 3. And as I said, you could just imagine that x goes to infinity. This becomes less and less significant. So it's essentially negative 6x over the square root of 4x squared. That would simplify to 2x. And then we could analyze it for a positive and negative infinity, and that would come out just fine. The problem that we got was when we let x be the square root of x squared. Then we had to, when x was going to negative infinity, we had to make that negative for that to work out. So that question was asked earlier, do we have two horizontal asymptotes sometimes? There's an example, sometimes we have two horizontal asymptotes. Will that approach as x approaches infinity? Infinity. Yeah. So the, the numerator will be much bigger than the denominator, uh, and it'll just go towards infinity. And here is uh, the thing that I want to look at. Uh, well, how about how about look at negative infinity as well? What's going to approach as x approaches negative infinity? It'll be infinity. negative infinity. Negative infinity, because now the numerator will still be positive, but the denominator will be negative. Okay. Okay. So this will be infinity. And this will be negative. <coughs> um, so, never mind. Good question. What, what I want to do with these kinds of problems, okay, and I'll specify what I mean by these kinds of problems, where the numerator has a degree that's one bigger than the denominator. Degree two over degree one, right? Okay. Um, what we're going to do is take x squared plus two and divide it by x minus one. Oh. Um, yes, we might want to. Uh, might want to make room for an x term plus. We do that long division, which we are not scared of. Okay. So, what do we multiply x by to get? Look. So here's what we're looking for. This thing that we're about to get, we'll be able to multiply x minus one by this thing, whatever it is, to get this. Right. So we're going to need to be able to distribute these terms into whatever this will be. Right. We can put it in parentheses. Put this in parentheses. When we distribute this stuff into that stuff, we should come out with that. So the first thing that we distribute the x to, should 
Looks like square. X. X has to be the thing that we distribute the X to. Okay. Now, in practice, when we actually go to multiply these together, we're going to have to multiply the X by X, but also multiply this X by negative 1. So let's see what that gives us. X times S is the X squared that we need. Okay. So the difference between those is 0, so that's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Yeah. X times negative 1 gives us negative X. Uh-oh. That's not what we want. Okay. So as it is, we wind up with this negative x, but we want to wind up with no x's, right? right? Yeah. So right now, it gives us a negative x. So somehow, we need to find out a way to add an x so then that we can wrap that negative x and get 0x. Then we just subtract the negative. So we subtract x squared from x squared, and we get 0. And we subtract x from 0 to get x. Okay. We still need an x now, because right now, we're getting a negative x. So this next term needs to give us a positive x. So when we add x to negative x, we get 0x like we want to get. Wait, why is it a positive x? Because there's a negative. Let's, oh, let's, let's look at it this way. Right now, all we found is an x. That x is what we need to get x squared. We need to multiply whatever this thing is by x minus 1. Okay. So far, what we've got is x squared minus, minus x. But we don't want to wind up with minus x, we want to wind up with 0x. You have to have a plus 1 because then it would be 1x and then 1x plus So, negative. yeah, we need to find a way to get a plus x so that this will be 0x. Doesn't that one What's that? Doesn't that one explain the 2? Okay, so that's, what, that's where we can discuss the asymptotal part of it. Okay? So, in order to get that 1x, we would need to put a plus 1 in there, right? That's where, that's where we put plus 1 right here. Yeah. Okay. When we distribute that 1, we'll get the x like we were hoping we would get. But we also get a minus 1, which is not, we don't want a minus 1. We don't want that, too. Right? Uh -oh. Okay, so we'll subtract the x from the x. That's exactly what we wanted. So we get the expected 0 left over. And then we got a 1. Then we got a... Oh, we minus three. a negative one, so we got three. Okay, so we've got the same thing. Uh, the problem here is we wind up getting um, a minus one, but we want a two. We, when we put the plus one right there and we distribute it to that, we get minus one. But we want plus two, which means we need to find a way to add three. Like we're out of, of stuff, whatever we put here, or, or here, or whatever, we have to multiply it not, not just by negative 1, but to multiply by x, so we have this issue. Okay? So the only thing we could put right there that we could distribute to both of these things is 3 over x Ooh. minus 1. Fix that oh 3, God. sir. That's fine. Oh. 3 looks great. So, the, the term that we would need to, to, to use to get that 3 is 3 over x minus 1. We would multiply the 3 over x minus 1 times x minus 1. The denominator x minus 1 would cancel. And we get left the 3 that we needed. That 3 that we needed right there. Okay? But that's just, right, we could say remainder 3. Right? Remainder 3. Right. So what we wind up with when we divide x squared plus 2 by x minus 1 is x plus 1 plus the remainder 3 over x The limit as x approaches uh, infinity of, of this function would be the same as the limit as x approaches infinity of this function. The same function, we just written them differently. Why so that we can see, not does it only go to infinity, but it goes to infinity in a certain kind of way. It makes a certain shape. Okay? So this graph is the same as this graph. They're the same thing. We just written it differently. Let's let's take a look at what the graph looks like. I will definitely agree. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll do this one. X squared plus two divided by X minus one. Okay, so let's cover that up. What's that look like if I cover the middle part up? Straight line. Looks like a straight line. What do you think the equation of that straight line is? Uh, 
X plus one. X plus one. How that disappear? <laughs> Uh, what? You have the pen in your hand, so. Did I push them? You might have, like, you went like this. We'll do the instantly later. Okay. <laughs> okay, x plus 1 is the equation of that line. That line is the asymptote. It's just not a horizontal asymptote, it's what we call a slant asymptote. Okay? So, this, this graph will act almost exactly like x plus 1, right, for large values of x. Because what happens to this for large values of x? What happens is just this piece really when x is very large, really small, really small right? Yeah. So the, the output of this function would be very close to x plus 1 and thrown off just a little bit by whatever this value is, which is really small. 3 divided by you know, 100 minus 1, or 3 divided by 99, right? That's a very little, tiny piece to add on to whatever that is. So we bring that graph back up. It looks like x plus 1. You can hardly tell the difference between this and x plus 1. Maybe you could even put in that graph x plus 1. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Crazy? What's going on? Are you crazy? <laughs> Honestly. I'm sorry, guys. That would have been so bad. I'm sorry that you saw me do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thoroughly embarrassed. It's like finding out about Santa Claus. No. No. What do you mean? What do you mean finding out about Santa Claus? What do you mean finding out about Santa Claus? Didn't Daniel? My cousin didn't know Santa was real until he was a freshman in high school. I wish that I would have been that way. Christmas is so much more exciting. Except for then he realized he's a fool and he's a freshman <laughs> in high school and couldn't figure out that his parents were Santa. I would still have enjoyed it. Maybe his parents are just ninjas. You never know how your kids are going to feel when they find out. That's, That's so why awesome. I'm starting to start. Like, Wait, you told them? My what? kids? What? They can't kidding? understand it right now, but that's what it'll be like. You're going to tell them Santa so doesn't exist. There's the slope Don't x, ever or the, the line you x plus one. You are an awful person. Don't x ever plus tell one. Them, let them find Listen, out. x plus <laughs> one, right? And the further we, we, we go this way towards negative infinity for x, the closer and closer our graph gets to x plus one, and vice versa for going to positive infinity. And we get thrown off to infinity because what's happening is we're getting close to one, and as x gets close to one, Whoa. this explodes and gets. You know, one divided by a very, very tiny number, the very tiny difference between one and one, or a number that's slightly bigger than one and one, or a number that's slightly less than one and one. Is that making sense? The closer we get to one, the more incredibly large this gets, and it just like throws it way off of its x plus one trajectory. Okay. What does your wife have to say about this? <laughs> what? She agrees. That your kids should know Sand in the Real from the get go. Yeah. Why? Sorry I ran it up, I didn't know it was so traumatic for you. That is. This right here is your slant oh, asymptote. Okay? They're going to tell all the other kids that Santa isn't real. They, Could you they make sure that's Please. This is crucial child and stuff. You can mess that up. This is the slant asymptote. <laughs> and we can find a slant asymptote just like we have uh, a horizontal asymptote. Now, why did it come out that that, that that asymptote part was a line, a degree one polynomial? Because the other is such a tiny, tiny number that it was being divided by the same. Part. Well, I mean, why did this come out to be an x to the first plus one and not x squared? Divided what by x? x squared. x squared by x. If you divide a degree 2 by a degree 1, you'll get a degree 1. But if we had a degree 3 divided by a degree 1? Degree 2. So your asymptote would be a slant asymptote? It would be a parabola. It would be a parabola what? asymptote. Can we do one like, and just see what it looks like? Uh, you can make one up. I mean, all you need yeah. to do is graph a function where when you divide this thing, whatever degree it is, by this, whatever this degree is, the results is a degree two. So you just need degree two degrees higher here than here. So you could just put x to the third. That's not to the third. You don't know how to utilize calculator, and it's thoroughly embarrassing. Oh, yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. It's thoroughly embarrassing. Whoa. Oh, that's x plus one. Let's zoom this out. We'll zoom out a little bit. I'm 
looks like a parabola. You can, it looks almost like a parabola. You can tell it's kind of like a, a little bit of a dent here, right? Yeah. But it's not quite a parabola because that's where the vertical asymptote is. If we were to zoom back in, we won't be able to see the right side of the parabola much at all. Okay, but you can see a little bit of it right there. It looks very much like a parabola until it gets here and it starts to deviate off of that. Okay? And if the difference between these two degrees was uh, three, then you would have an a asymptote that looks like a cubic. Your function would look mostly like a cubic until it got to that vertical asymptote and so you get thrown off by that almost zero denominator of your little remainder right there. So I'd like you to be able to find a slant asymptote. I'm not going to care much about finding a parabola asymptote or a cubic asymptote or whatever. Um, we should be able to now find our horizontal asymptotes, whether they be 3 or negative 3 or, or 5 halves or 0. Okay, zero is another possibility. It's a degree the denominator is greater. And we should be able to find a slant asymptote. Okay. So that's what all this section is about. It's just about asymptotes. It's just about limits at infinity. Okay? And in the next section, when we continue on to that, it'll take the middle stuff, the points of inflection, the maxima and minima, the, and all the other stuff we've learned before, vertical asymptotes, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, all this stuff, increasing, decreasing behavior, put it together with end behavior, and we'll put all that together into to one big lump, okay. then we'll be able to graph uh, you know, lots and lots of different kinds of things. So I'll put your, your homework up there. It is, it's already uh, there. Oh, I already did it. Very good. Okay. So, do we have, like, we have 3.6 also? Oh, sorry. It's just 3.5. Okay, cool. 3.6 is where you put it all together. I have to work okay. Mondays, Fridays, and Sundays. But then I have to work half shifts for the ladies.